Welcome to Live Long and Podcast Star Trek Enterprise Rewatch Series. <coughs> it's been over 20 years uh, since tonight's episode, which is Dear Doctor, first aired. Uh, but we're just getting started here on Enterprise at 8. And I'm Jody Simpson, and my co-host tonight is none other than the man who would fight you that an eggplant is a vegetable, Adam <laughs> Woodward. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> oh, okay. But, but I wrote thanks that for wrong, welcoming though. me, Jody. Um, I... You know what? I have nothing but good things to say tonight. It's going to be a fun, yeah. fun chat. Um, John Billingsley really, really uh, did a great job tonight I in this episode. Completely. And of course, also joining Adam and I, our autism producer and the man who would also cry at the end of For Whom a Bell Tolls, along with Trip, Dave Mater. Oh, uh, Teak Teak. Um, teak and uh, it's just something in my eye. You know, don't, it's nothing, you know. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. And of course, who can forget the man who is on his very long quest to like Archer as a captain, Kevin Millard. Almost okay today. He's almost okay. <laughs> That's why I wrote it that way, because I'm like, yeah, he might be okay today. I wonder how much screen time he actually had. No, no, what happened to him? See what happened. Sorry. Didn't have a lot, which is good. Uh, anyway, tonight's episode is Dear Doctor. This is the 13th episode in the series. Uh, the crew encounters an alien race in, dis uh, in desperate need of medical and scientific assistance, but Dr. Phlox refuses to treat them because of his ethical beliefs, which is a very interesting proposition for a Star Trek episode. We've seen something like this before, uh, but not as told this way. So I, I do like the ending of this uh, episode. I, I think this is a fantastic episode. Um, this to me is probably one of the best episodes of season one, uh, which I guess, you know, I guess the bar isn't that high, but still it's, it's, it's good so far. Uh, but the question is, what did you guys think? So Adam, I guess we'll start with. Yeah. I, you know, so far this year, we've been introduced to many characters. Uh, Flox is being probably the most mysterious one because we don't know him about him, but also just in interesting, you know, he, yeah. I think, as I said, it uh, the the guy who plays him, John Billingsley, just nails it tonight. He did a, a, a great job in this episode. His delivery of the lines, but I, you know, Kevin, you'll appreciate this. Like other episodes we've watched this year, you know, you've you've gone so far, and then you're like, but you could have just gone a little further. Right. And I think tonight they they did that extra mile and and did a good job, and they kept Archer out of things, which was yeah. positive. Mm -hmm. Even Hoshi, even Hoshi was good. Yeah, Hoshi did not annoy me, annoy me in this episode. Yeah. Hoshi was like, all right, um, yeah. <laughs> this, Dave, this what were your thoughts? Kind of, kind of everything I'm looking for in a Star Trek episode. It's got some relationship stuff. It's got some, uh, and it's got like an overarching moral question yes. that really doesn't fully get answered either. Like, they make mm -hmm. a decision, but is it the right one, really? So I was I was uh, watching the recent uh, episode of uh, Star Trek Radio Theater, which happens to also be on this channel. Uh, yes. And there was a comment that caught me at the end of that episode, which was you two, the two down at the bottom, Kevin and Dave, both telling about how I keep saying that Enterprise is going to get better. Get better. <laughs> so my question to you is this guy. I'm so glad you, you saw get that. better in this episode. You caught that, huh? Yes, I did catch that. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, but I do watch most of the content on this channel. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I appreciate <laughs> you getting to find out when I'm name dropped. Yeah, uh, I appreciate you getting to the end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I guess well, the, the, the question here, though, is it, do we feel that this is an episode that's making this series better? Yes. In my opinion, yes. Um, I, I think that uh, it's long overdue. I think that um, I have a couple critiques of the episode. It's not a perfect episode, but it's it's damn near close. Um, it, it's uh, I think that the fact that Archer ultimately makes the right call here, I think, is maybe a bit lazy. Uh, I think that maybe him screwing up this culture 
maybe would have been um, more interesting to me because I think that the need to have a prime directive, I think has to have maybe some examples of things going really bad first and for them to sort of learn the lesson. And here they were kind of like, well, in theory, we're not here to play God and, you know, and whatever. But I think that the, the moral dilemma they're faced with, you know, do you hate help these people? What's their natural evolution? This, this, like this, but this arbitrary threshold of warp technology and that being the point where you would uh, provide humanitarian compassionate aid seems, you know, somewhat arbitrary. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, I think that, uh, but all, but, and the, and my other criticism of it is that the cold open sucks. Period. Yes. Like it's just. I agree. You don't need like the, uh, if I, I if didn't I need was to see Flock saying good morning to everybody. And he was going around like saying hello to his bats. When all these things. Yeah, but, but like it that... did give us something that was interesting, which was wait, wait. right at the end when he eats the worm. Oh, yeah. Right. Right. But but I don't think that was necessarily bad because later in the episode he's sitting at a table by himself. Like all he's got is these things. Like I don't yeah, think he point. has a lot of relationships uh, other than. I guess it's supposed to it. show how isolated he really is. Exactly, right. yeah. his quest to not be as isolated, which obviously has to do with uh, Ensign Cutler. Or whatever. This is also how is. most Star Trek episodes that are narrated by a character start. Usually, them alone, <laughs> day to just day, just doing something in their quarters or That's you know, true. yeah. Yeah, so, like I, I've seen this before, and I just watching the cold open tonight. It's like him just going around the sick bay, and I was like, okay, but like if I didn't know anything about the show, or I don't know if this opening scene would grab me and make me watch the rest of the episode necessarily. You know, I did. It's, I'd have to yeah, think. it's not a good. It's not a good thing for grabbing the attention. Like at, at that point, you're just like, why are they even showing me this? But Adam does make a very good point, which is we don't know much about Flocks up to this point. I didn't know that. Denobulans didn't like to be touched. I, I learned that in this episode. Um, I don't know if that was mentioned previous. I don't think um, so. And obviously the relationships they have, you know, relationships where they have multiple marriages at once. Um, I can't remember what they call that, but same uh, same idea that we have here um, with some, some of the people that do that. Polygamy, that's it. Um, and then we also have, you know, various mating rituals and, and, you know, doesn't like to be touched, but yet, you know, gets a kiss on the cheek from Cutler later on in the episode and stuff like that. And you can tell that he's trying to adapt, which is, I guess, in a way that shows us his character because his character is really a character that wants to evolve. He's, he's there for the sole purpose of exploration. He's not only, exp you know, exploring space, but he's also exploring humanity. Uh, he, he, he also was, made some interesting comments in this too. I mean, first of all, I I didn't ever see Flocks as being somebody who wasn't reached out by the the rest of the crew. Like, I think he would be very interesting to talk to. He, he's yeah. welcoming. He speaks well. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a bit of a surprise. But also, he I think he said when when he was writing Doctor Lucas, he said I, I didn't expect to be here so long, but here I am. You know. Yeah. He, like, so this was a very temporary assignment for him. I think when they started as maybe even well to paul we know as well but here they are you know well, you so. get the impression from the first episode that he was kind of just thrown on for this mission like the mission to return the klingon <laughs> yeah uh back yeah. to uh, chronos and then and then obviously they they kept going uh so maybe he didn't expect that part um uh, but either way I, I you know as you said uh adam uh, coming into this episode is you know it John, John Billingsley is a is a great actor. He's a great performer. I think he's fantastic in Star Trek, um, and I think I think he really does the character. Like Flox is one of my favorite characters on the show. Uh, yeah, or none. And this episode does it even more for me. So yeah, I think this episode really gives gives a little more dimension to his character too because mm -hmm. he was getting to be like he's awesome, but he's getting to be like cartoonishly positive. Yeah, well, especially when you saw the and then this episode, yeah. he's he's a little more brooding and he's like struggling with things, and it's it's good. It's it's really good character. I, I really like his interactions with Archer, especially when they get to the crisis part. Um, the the interactions are great. Like you expect him to be mad, he's not mad, but he's he's upset with his captain. Yeah, but he, but that he, again, he plays the Star Trek captain role, or sorry, Doctor role, great in that in that capacity. Yes. He's not being rolled over by the captain. He's no. standing to his beliefs and, and what he should be doing. And this is how he should be acting. So, you know, yeah, he, he should have a start uniform on, honestly. 
Yeah, like yes. I was going to say, like, you know, we we think of Starfleet as being, the, I guess, this, this human invention that it is. But, like, I think, like, the spirit of what Starfleet becomes, like, in the 23rd century and beyond, I think a lot comes from Phlox and his influence on this particular crew and what mm. sort of, like, I guess, what would become sort of, like, the standard for Starfleet um, yeah. going forward, right? Like, you know, in terms of certain no, attitudes. Of that, quite honestly, that's a good observation. Yeah, like, and that, you know, I, I think that, that Phlox where i think it would have been nice for him to be like eventually made a member of starfleet he never is like throughout the yeah. run of the show he's always just like on loan from the denoblia or whatever well and, and it's an exchange program they the the denoblians have a human which is obviously the person that his counterpart that he's talking to mm -hmm. uh which is locus uh what's his first name dr right? lucas Jeremy dr. Locus, lucas. I think. yeah something like that yeah he's the one um, that we get later on right he's the guy that uh that uh that brent spiner is going to shove into that uh gas chamber I think so. Yeah, yeah, but like spoilers. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> you know, from two years from now. Twenty years ago. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh but anyway, let's let's talk about this episode. There there's not a lot of major plot points in this episode, in my opinion. It, it's a it's a very it's a it's a very dialogue heavy episode, uh, which is kind of the point. It's 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 a dilemma. Um so we we get uh obviously that the scene that we just talked about, and then we get the opening credits, and then after that we see um, essentially what appears to be Phlox on a date. Um, the, he's he's on a, at least some sort of outing when it comes to movie night, uh, which they've mentioned in the past. Um, apparently they have, what was it, 50,000 titles? 50, uh, this is pre-Netflix, so that's a pretty impressive. Uh, what Was this a real movie? We'll find out in Fun Facts, yes, it but is. it's a real movie? Because <laughs> yes, I pulled... I room the bell tolls. I pulled a clip from it, and I was just like, what are they talking... I've never seen it. We won't be going to America this time. But always I go with you wherever you go. Understand? Yeah, it's... it's you, a go now, easy... you go now, Maria. You go now, Maria. No, I stay with you, Rebecca. No, Maria. no, no, I'll stay with you. What I do now, I do alone. I couldn't do it anywhere here. <laughs> no, but yes, no. it is a real movie. Uh, and actually, funny enough, they do, they do actually show other things throughout the series of them watching movies. And they're all real movies that they show. Okay. Uh, so, which is interesting. They probably, probably I'm, I'm, I'm sure the parent company owns. Uh, but, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. Either way. So anyway, he's on. He's on this. I guess he doesn't think it's a date. I guess, but um, Ensign is it Ensign Cutler? She's crewman, actually. Crewman Cutler. Okay. Um, it, I guess crewman Cutler is sitting there holding the popcorn, and you know they're having a movie night kind of thing. And Flox is really you get a you get the impression that Flox is more interested in the people in the room. Uh, than he is the movie. <laughs> he goes, uh, no, he... I, I, I'm sensing the rising emotional undercurrent in the room. I want to yeah. see if it culminates in some kind of group response. I was like, what, like an orgy or something? Like, well, what are you that's... expecting to happen here? <laughs> but yeah. again, that could be something that's completely normal to do. Hold that as a clip. One sec. I'm sensing a rising emotional undercurrent in the room. I'm curious to see if it culminates in some kind of group response. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that too, Dave. Um, you know, a little less. You're all dirty. <laughs> I I did. I I did think that, but at the same time, I was also thinking, man, it, I, I miss people and and getting together like that. You know, mm -hmm. in some capacity, it's been you know, like, and you know, it, you know, you guys don't know me that well, but I love I love movies, and I love. I used to go every week. Yeah, every you week. and I have a lot of the same picks and movies. Yeah, uh, you and I, when we talk, we always find out that. <laughs> Yeah, so. but it, it's it's there's something about going to a movie with people, and and so I, I really do identify with him saying that because part of that experience is not on your couch; it's being in an auditorium with 500 people or 50 people, whatever it is, and and seeing and feeling how they respond as well. And I, I that's something I think we've missed for two years now. That's the only thing he likes about it. But like when she asks him about movies on Denoblia. They don't have movies where you come from, do they? <laughs> well, we had something similar a few hundred years ago, but they lost their appeal when people discovered their real lives were more interesting. So so my <laughs> wife jumped all over me when that came up, eh? She goes, yeah. <laughs> she goes, yeah, we should be discovering our real lives at it. <laughs> <laughs> Right, because you remember, you like, she's fishing for orgies there, uh, Adam. Or <laughs> oh, in my dreams, she's like she wants a group response. Um, but I hope uh, she doesn't watch this. Yeah, uh, 
the um the whole like, like they say that like when Picard meets remember when Picard uh thaws out those uh those dead people like you know in next generation oh, yes, and, yeah. and he go they go hey you got a movie and he's like a movie like no we don't do that anymore we yeah we, we have string we quartets are, we have string quartets <laughs> our real lives are more interesting we do you know and then we go the whole got an android and he plays violin <laughs> <laughs> chief o'brien plays the cello <laughs> you haven't heard a cello until you've heard chief o'brien do it yeah, he was going to go to the Adalbrin Music Academy once, you know, until he yeah. ran off and joined Starfleet. But yeah, like I, um, the idea that, like, I guess TV and movies will become passe eventually because they're, they're yeah, sort in, of a fad. In all seriousness, yes, that that, that could happen, I guess, but uh, but not today, <laughs> not today, <laughs> exactly. So anyway, um, we we have this we have this you know relationship, or at least one person thinks this is some sort of budding relationship. Uh, and you know, she's kind of in a way, you know, he walks her back to her, um, her, uh, I guess her cabin. And, uh, at that point, you know, she's, it looks like she's waiting for a kiss or something like that. And, uh, you know, he's just like, okay, see ya, you know, maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll do this again. <laughs> you know, you know, like he, he obviously is not uh, clear with the social aspect of things. Yeah. There you go. That's a, there she is from there. Um, and, 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 you know, obviously this lady is looking for a little bit more, um, you know, not looking very, to be wife number four, Jody. No. Well, that's later on. We find out about yeah. that, but, uh, she's, she's just looking to have a friend and maybe have some benefits on the side or maybe orgies. I don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, that's she Adam's just, big hey, territory that's now. Where but, it takes uh, us. <laughs> that's going to work if they, if he doesn't want to be touched though. Yes. Well, that's going to have a hard, it's going to be very hard to have orgies when you don't touch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, but, but wait anyway. a second. I mean, at the beginning of the episode, you talk about uh, Jeremy Lucas talking about how hard it is on Deloblia because of its mating season. So something. Yes. Like, Which I, means I, that, they get crazy at one point. I want to know more about that. Well, <laughs> and I think they wanted to leave that open to interpretation because I don't think we ever find that out. We know they go blowfish in their face uh, at times, those Denoblians, right? So, uh, yes, well, that's a sign. They, they do those really creepy uh, smiles as well. Uh, I got think the you hibernation get to meet cycle. one of uh, Flux's wives at some wives at some point. Yeah, yes, yeah, wait, uh, yeah. What? At least one of them comes along, I think, yeah. at one point. Uh, maybe yeah. more. Yeah, we do. Yeah, but learning more about his culture, I find interesting. You know, it's a fictional culture, and you know, and, and everything else. Uh, Jody, you also missed this scene at the beginning, though, where uh, you know. Archer oh, giving yes, that dog bro. cheese. The dog he keeps giving his dog cheese, and his dog has some sort of gas issue. I don't know why we even need to talk about this, but we do. I, guess. I, 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 because I think it's the metaphor for the um, for the episode. He's what does he say to Archer in this episode? You got to learn how to say no, Captain. Ooh, you learn true. how to say no, Captain. Okay, there you go. You know. Well, and the other thing that's interesting about this is um, his uh, Flox's voiceover. He's like, you know, I don't understand these humans. They they take lesser species and, you know, they, they have emotional attachment to them and they talk to them all the time and stuff like you that. Know, I, you know, it's so true. Like, I talk to my dog constantly, even though I know the dog doesn't understand anything. But yeah, but so, so he seems to right. he's opening Sorry. the episode that way. I mean, he's talking to everything. Yeah, true. Yeah. Well, and he I, says, you know, I, I occasionally talk to my bat every so often. Yeah, he's, I talk to the bat. I've noticed how the captain seems to anthropomorphize his pet. He even talks to the creature, although I'm fairly certain it has no idea what he's saying. He's fairly certain it doesn't know what he's saying. I, I just wish that sometime, sometime through this, this series, they it turns out Porthos is actually an alien or something. That would have been cool. <laughs> it's Odo. Yeah, maybe it's Odo. <laughs> maybe it's like a preform of Odo. Odo is a child. He's like, remember that one time that I uh, hung out on an Enterprise ship? And no more cheese, Odo. <laughs> yeah, or, or I, you know what though? In DS Nine, did you ever see Odo eat cheese? Mm. He only was like he only had a there stomach for like half a season. So, but yeah. in an episode, he was a very convincing dog. <laughs> That's True. right. Yeah. True. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm, I'm going to put it out there. Maybe this is Odo. We don't know. Open legs and everything. Uh, anyway, eventually we get to a point where. Um, the Enterprise encounters this ship, um, this little tiny ship. Do you have a picture of that? Uh, one yeah. light year away from home. One, only yeah. one light year away from home because this is a pre-warp society. Um, so, you know, they got the old impulse engines running. And um, there's two faint life signs on this ship. Um, and this is about the only time you ever actually see Mayweather uh, in this episode other than one other part of the time. Is he in this episode? Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he gets talked to at one point. Uh, but uh, my my yeah. theory is still set, which is the less Mayweather, the better. Um, After last week, they need we all needed a break from him. 
Yeah. Yes, there, yeah. Was, there was a lot of Mayweather last week. And, <laughs> no, uh, Reed, no, no Reed really in this episode either. Uh, but Well, no, Reed, you just see Reed says one line, which is, you know, basically, oh, I don't have time. I need, I'm needed in the armory. And I'm busy. It, so he's gone. I was busy last week. So this week I just have to show up for one day at work. See you yeah. later. <laughs> I, I'm going back to the armory where the beer is. <laughs> yeah. Uh, where I, where but, I don't have to talk to Flux. Exactly, yeah, but yeah. we we meet this guest star, the Vol- the Valakian astronaut. I guess he looks familiar, but I don't I didn't look him up, so I don't know. Um, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, he looks like he's probably played a bunch of aliens. Or yeah, uh, I think, I, I'm really trying to remember familiar. where that uniform is from. I, I seem to remember that from something else as well. It, it looks like Daniel's uniform that he was wearing, uh, like Almost, later on. Yeah. But yeah. but his is black, uh, and this yeah. one's white. Um, Maybe they just dyed it. So yeah, this guy uh, who played him was Christopher Rydell. Rydell. Uh, yeah, doesn't ring a bell. It seems, this seems to be his only character. Oh, okay. Well, on Star Trek. Either way, I, I thought it was a decent performance. His mother was on Star Trek, Joan Linville, and she had played the Romulan commander in the episode uh, The Enterprise Incident. Oh, if you really? Remember, really? Uh, the fe- yeah, so that, this is her son. Fun facts. You got to stop giving out all these fun facts. I know, I know. Another what fun what, fact: What is Adam going to do? She's the first female commander in Star Trek. First Period. woman captain yeah. of any species. Of any True. species. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, anyway, we end up we end up finding out that these these two aliens have left their left their planet because there is a condition that's happening uh, and it's affecting the uh, what is it one in three of the population? One, one in three are getting infected with it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's and, killing them. And it's it's killing them. So they they're on they were on a hunt to find another species to help them. Yeah. Uh, they mentioned the Ferengi which, too. Did they? I didn't even. Yeah, they did. That. They said they've 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 been in touch with the Ferengi and who was the other one, Dave? Uh, it was not one I knew from anything. Um, I feel but like it's the one they made. Hold on, J- uh, lovely Jane Mater has uh, chimed in. About Mal- this, the so. Malexa, Maclexa? The uniform there looks it like is. the Jesus light guy crusher episode. I agree. I think that's exactly where he, it looks like it. So I, I think. Oh, right. like uh, the one that uh, that you know, what's that episode called? Transfigurations. The the one where the guy can heal everybody. The John Doe. Yeah, the John Doe guy that can heal everybody. Kevin, uh, you played Jane, that. Jane's character, on the ball right? today. Did yeah. I play that character? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, well, that shows what I remember. Come on, Kevin. <laughs> come on. Get your head <laughs> in the Zalax- game. He was a Zalaxian. Anyway, so we, okay. we, we, we find the ship uh, has the two occupants. The two occupants are on their way to try to find something, but now they've become ill. Uh, and Archer decides to bring the ship in uh, very bludgeonly. Uh, uh, or, or, sorry, I didn't say that one right. Uh, but he, he didn't want to, <laughs> I guess. It, it, that was the impression I got, but he ended up bringing it in anyway. Um, well, I think he's... Still, you never know, like, though, with his acting. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's it's interesting because they know they don't have a prime directive yet, but there's they're they kind of do respect that the idea of cultural contamination to a degree. Yeah. Um, but don't you think this is so out of character for Archer after eleven other episodes? But, but this is like, this is my theory that humble get, uh, he gets more humbled as the episodes go on because like last week's episode he definitely did. Um, you know, in he was showing some remorse and stuff like that. So it's. You know, I, I think this is Archer learning how to deal with the fact that he is not the omnipotent being that he believes he is, uh, and he doesn't deserve everything he has. Um, so I think this is kind of uh, his way of equaling himself out. So he ends up bringing the ship into uh, one of the shuttle bays uh, and ends up obviously telling Flocks that he needs to deal with these characters. And then, you know, certainly we get a scene in the med uh, thing where he finds out they, they basically bring him... Uh, you know, bring him back to consciousness. Uh, one of the guys, uh, and obviously they have a hard time. I, I do like how they always portray the universal translators as not working spot on all the time. Mm-hmm. Um, I love mm-hmm. that. Uh, that's one of the my favorite things about this series is, and it's something they do for the first couple seasons. Uh, whereas we were so used to watching like, Star Trek, everybody spoke English. Didn't matter who it was, uh, and if they didn't speak English, they would know in a couple seconds what they were saying. Uh, this was where, a very cool scene. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I, I think, I think that uh, that you know, it was like I agree with you. I, I agree that like it's yeah. interesting that they that it gives Hoshi something to do. I think that her her purpose here is is clear. You know what her role is on the she ship. She is not annoying in this episode at all, uh, which yeah. is hard for me to say as a person who doesn't like Hoshi. 
Um, but but he, she thinks she, that she um, eggplants are nostrils, Jody. Well, and that does happen. Um, <laughs> but she also says that it's a fruit, and it's technically not. Uh, it's not but a... no, I actually had to look this up though because Don't eggplants have seeds. Just because something has seeds uh, doesn't make it a it doesn't make it a fruit. Okay, it's a nightshade. It's a nightshade. Uh, yeah. Cucumbers have seeds; they're not fruits. So yeah, you're right. Um, so, but okay. I did make I did make a special ticker for this though, which which is eggplant, fruit or vegetable, or vegetable or there neither, or neither could I be neither. True. I think it is one of them. But uh, did you like them just built in Denoblian? Denoblian, please. Uh, I, I, I like I like the fact that she's learning. I, I like the fact that he's helping her tutor her. Uh, this is that. everything that I think most of us haven't liked about her up until. Sorry, I think I may have said that wrong. But long and short, she she short she came out as a as a <clears throat> as an officer. Now she she as a she has a role. She's smart as hell, you know. And yeah. um, I I love the watching the translator work, the Universal Translator. I think that was great. Yeah. I really liked when you know the first the first couple of words were spoken. She's like she's looking at Archer like, nope, I need more. There's no way I can figure this out until I get more information <laughs> yeah, from him. He said two things like, come on, no. <laughs> yeah, like, give it, me more it, than it, that. It, it isn't that good, you know. And it's obviously it's it's a technology that progresses later on. Uh, but you know, it's, what would have been great is if she just stood forward and took control of the situation and started engaging in conversation. I think rather than asking Archer, but but it's yeah, not her I, role. I, it's not her role. So well, it is a role to figure out. <laughs> it's her role to figure it out, but not to communicate with the aliens. Not not right. in that way. Like it, it, not Ar Archer's there; he's present, so therefore, he right. should be the chain one. of command. Chain of command. Chain of command. The, the pre preference is always for the tran the universal translator to to get to that point. Unless, like we see with the mank, it, that wasn't apparently possible for the translator to do it directly. No, but it why? Couldn't, it couldn't figure them out because it was too primitive of a communication. Okay. Uh, or at least that's the impression I got. But you know, but certainly, Hoshi was learning their words, and they didn't seem that. Yeah, because Hoshi, Hoshi is a linguistic expert. She understands, you know, things that I guess the the translator doesn't understand correctly. So. Translator can't understand teak teak. Well, I get the idea that she sort of has to program the translator too as yeah. it goes. Like teak teak means well, thank yeah. you. So if I say teak teak, I should just hear thank you, but I don't. I hear yeah. teak teak. And I just imagine that some languages would be more difficult than others. Yeah. Very good. Whether they're primitive or not, right? This mank language. Yes. Uh, <laughs> and the and this whole scene with uh to Paul and uh, um the one that's behind me right now, which I know we're jumping a little ahead here, but um that scene is also I, I, and Flux? I love I, I love yeah. the two of them. The uh, the dentistry scene? The dentistry scene, yes. I, I like it because he's looking for guidance, right? And it's you don't get the impression that Flox is the kind of guy that really needs guidance. He he's he's pretty spot on. He's a very intelligent person. Um, so you kind of get that impression, but he obviously doesn't understand this. But I also like some of the stuff that she says in this. She but is the, such a downer. She's like, in my hum in my experience, humans suck. In my experience, yeah. humans lack the emotional maturity for interspecies relationships. They tend to be easily infatuated with things they find new. This crewman may simply be Satisfying her curiosity at your expense. But she's not wrong. She's just salty because she's got to get some dental work done and she doesn't want to. Oh, she yeah, because that dental work looks like it was a really hard thing. Take, take care of my teeth. It's like getting a scar dealt with in next gen, right? Like they, they always have these like huge gashes out of their heads or something. And then they're like, mm -mm, okay, we're done. Yeah, here's they, a blue light. Like, and where yeah, you go. yeah. Or like headaches, how they deal with headaches. It's just like zap. Okay, you're good. You know, but, it's like okay. C coming back to the scene, though, it, yeah. it's interesting who he takes on to be his consultant, right? It's it's the other <laughs> alien. It's the other right. alien, yeah. yeah. The non, the other non-human, yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. I also like how this bridges into how later on Archer and her have a conversation, which is essentially, okay, I'm starting to understand how Romulans feel, or um, sorry, uh, Vulcans feel about having to be on earth for the last 90 years mm -hmm. right? like that's I, one of the I, best I lines in, in the episode it, yeah. yeah yeah so which we'll talk we've been about here for too. 90 years and i was just like you know what humans are jerks to these vulcans because they've been helping us for 90 years you know yeah. some, <laughs> um, it's taken them 90 years to get to warp five space travel so clearly clearly we were dragging our asses on this and how, 
<laughs> and how, and I, I'm sure those early decades were not easy peasy because we saw the state Earth was in when Zephyr Cochran did the first launch, right? Like, so, yeah, ooby dooby, ooby dooby, ooby dooby. I think the worst thing about that was their fucking music. Like their music was terrible. So, uh, it was for sure. Uh, it's after all. We don't have time to discuss this. this time. <laughs> We just don't have the time. <laughs> Moving on. Exactly. All right. Uh, oh, and also, one, one other thing. Uh, he wears gloves in this scene, which I know is sanitary, but uh, normally um, I don't think of them wearing gloves uh, no. or in, the, in the med bay. Uh, so I think for this scene. He's going to put his fingers in her mouth. Like, I get it. Sense. And, and for this scene, never mind like the, the actual era they're in it's like he's putting his hands in her mouth and she probably goes you're not going to be doing this until you put some gloves on thank you very much <laughs> right yeah. right well um i don't think well, Vulcan's i wonder what to, touched either, i wonder right? what to noble and smell like because we know humans don't smell very good to her so i wonder what he smells like i don't think we she ever get that she doesn't yeah. complain about it so we can she doesn't can complain refer. so maybe he doesn't smell like the, us and, and the most do. depressing part of this whole thing is that dentistry hasn't changed that much and you're still freaking putting things in people's mouths okay he filled a cavity in like less than a second <laughs> yeah i know With that no part. drilling I but think you're still that's freaking progress. putting a piece of metal into the guy's mouth i just or to that's her progress man we uh, never really progress. see like in other Star Trek de- a lot of dentistry being done ever. I didn't even know they did dentistry None. in the 20, 22nd century or whatever it is. <laughs> yeah, apparently. Um, but they still, you know, it's it's just it's part of medicine. You know, Makes it's part sense. of your health. So yeah. it seems like something he would well, have to the, do. Back back you know back in the early days, uh, you know, our barbers were the ones that were doing dentistry. So you know. Oh, maybe Mott the barber takes that over uh, later on. Not to be oh. confused with Mott Tyrell. No, no, two, two definitely different people. Uh, but anyway, we should get Mott to play Mott though. So anyway, they <laughs> they end up they end up jumping down. Uh, obviously, the the whole relationship thing with Flocks is the side story. It's the B story on this one. Um, well, might even be the A story technically. But um, anyway, we we end up going down to the planet, um, and this is where we find out that um, there's actually two races uh, on this planet. We have the what is it? The Valkyrians, the Valakians, Valakians, and the, the Valakians, which are the people that they found. Uh, and then there's also the Tent or Tank, Tank, Mink, 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 Mink. That's it. Man, I'm terrible at this shit. Uh, anyway, <laughs> and it so turns out the Valakians that. all have COVID. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> genetic <laughs> COVID. <laughs> but again, this is like where this 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 whole conversation about two distinct like species forming on a planet like is amazing like yeah you know. it's a neat it's a neat idea and it's something that we don't see in star trek all that much now we have Never. seen episodes where there's been two two societies until the zindi uh, will blow that open in a few seasons from now yes yes the zindi when you figure out that the zindi have like six different paths uh right. then we'll then we'll start realizing that but we're, we're not there yet and we got well, to leave uh, something yeah, like, for kevin to experience later it's interesting uh, this idea that uh well let that in Star Trek, on most planets, there's only one like sort of sentient race that kind of makes it through the evolutionary process. Yeah, which makes sense when you think about it, because really, there would the 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 strongest do survive, right? So it's 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 in this scenario, they've had two. They've had a primitive race, uh, which has survived pretty well, but they really do kind of live in almost the the shade of of the. Uh, of they're the playing ones. a servant. Uh, they're playing a servant role. Like everything yeah. they're doing is like, yeah. go get this, you know, do that. They're not professionals. They're, there's no doctors that are that that role. However, as this episode goes on, you find out how brilliant they are and yeah. undersold, I think, yeah. which again, and I think there was a, this is going an interesting path because they talk about, I don't know if we're, we're there in the episode yet, but um, how some of the enterprise crew find this very unpalatable mm-hmm. and they're, they're judging the Valakians for it. Sam right. says, "Hey, by the way, hey Sam, hey Glad Sam, and uh, Jackson CNW uh, from Twitch says, can you talk about anime, please? I think you might be on the wrong channel. But, <laughs> yeah, uh, I think you might want to go uh, check out Davin's podcast. Uh, yeah, Gavin, Gavin's got some anime there. Uh, he might, you might be more interested in him. Anyway, 
Um, where are we now? We're well, we're just talking about these mank and like the I I think that like the whole thing where uh where like you know um Flox and Cutler and Hoshi go down and they're taking the blood samples from the mank because the mank aren't being killed by this disease, so they nope. you know nope. so they want to me into it figure that out but i think like what i think one of the best lines in the episode is or it, it, it's part of flox's letter but um you know he says that you know he says our cultures are different uh things are different um but he thinks that the mink are being exploited and but despite the fact that the mink are not asking for humans to be their little protectors or to be their advocates they think the mink are being exploited by the Balakians. So their first instinct is to rise to their defense, despite the fact that the Mank don't appear to need or want a defender. This is amazing. <laughs> this, this, yeah, because we're we're going down the path finally of of what rights do humans or Starfleet have in you know assessing and judging other cultures, and, and Next Generation did it fantastically through the whole series. Yes, uh, but this is the first time enterprise took it on. And I think, <clears throat> I think in a lot of ways they, they did better. Um, I, I like this episode for the, how they deal with it because at the end of the day, this episode, and let's not get to the ending yet, but the, the episode really does end the way that I thought it should, um, which is it still leaves us open. It leaves us a little bit open, but we understand what's going on and we understand why we got to this conclusion. Um, but, and I, I think in some of the, in some of the next gen episodes that, that tackled this type of thing, they did do a good job though. Uh, but I think this one, I, I, I personally think this episode exceeded anything that, uh, that next gen did when it comes to this type of thing. Um, just because always at the end, there was always some sort of happy answer, uh, where we don't have happy at the end of this episode. We have suitable, I guess. Uh, but that's about it. At least that's the impression I got. But I think that, you know, we, when when was this filmed? This episode? What year? Two thousand and two. Right. So post two thousand and one, mm -hmm. you know, where next gen is all happy and bright and <laughs> life is going to be so good. But if you look at how TV and writing changed after nine eleven, yes, it, it we became got a lot a, more dramas, a lot, a lot more, more drama, a lot more dark. Battlestar yeah. Galactica. Um, you know, it could be could be that just that change in how America felt about things and yeah. at that point. Well, yeah, the, I, the I writing think, is going to get affected by that, I'm sure. I think that the, this issue is as relevant today as it was 20 years ago. And this idea of like, how do you uh, perceive and uh, judge other cultures? I guess you know how yeah. that when they don't reflect your values, you know, and what 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 can you when we look at like <clears throat> Muslim countries and other parts of the world that and, have and more Sharia importantly, law, do you have the right to do that? Do we or don't we? I don't know. Like, yeah. I think that it's it's an, like um, for another we're getting, species. We're getting I way think deep that, here, but well, I think <laughs> it's, that's, that's the that's the series. That's yeah, the oh, no, I agree. Yeah. Remember uh, an inalienable, inalienable human rights. Remember that conversation from undiscovered, undiscovered country. Country. Yeah. Yes. Even your you you really hear yourself an alien, right? Yeah. Um. Right. Versus like. Uh, well, yeah, but we have to have some principles and what we think is right and wrong and what we'll accept in, in, in like what you, we'll allow. Yeah, Starfleet has to have those principles, but do they have to spread them amongst the universe? And I guess that's really the debate we get here, right? Because we get, how do we deal with this? We have the ability to help these guys out, but in reality, we're screwing around with evolution. Playing um, God, so, yeah. Yeah, we're playing God at this point, and Flox is not comfortable with that. He's and not I think it, all, with it. it also ties into just I, I think if you think of like the history of the United States, where the show comes from and yep. the idea of manifest destiny and spreading freedom around the world and, you know, like what was going on, uh, you know, during this time and in the years that followed with like, you know, George W. Bush saying, we're going to go to Iraq and we're going to give them freedom and we're going to give them our values. Yeah. And then they're going to yeah. they're just eventually gonna... stood on a uh, an aircraft carrier with a mission accomplished sign. And right. Right. And but uh, yeah. but I don't think that really worked. I don't think that, uh, you know, Iraq <laughs> is this great uh, democracy today that has now been Western. No, but it was nice to think it was right. right. You know, so, and for that moment in time, they had that, I guess. And the same thing comes to this. Right. Which is. You know, we have this dilemma. So Flox figures out that, you know, after he gets these blood samples from the uh, from uh, all the all the people that he grabs them from, um, he ends up he ends up coming to the conclusion that this is not actually a virus. This is this is not a disease. This isn't a virus. This is an evolution thing. 
And what's happening is their their DNA is breaking down. It, it's it, we're done. We're almost there. Right? You know, they, they this species doesn't have a lot of time left. Uh, and it's 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 one of those things that um, you know brings up this dilemma, right? It brings up the dilemma of do we help them? You if know, but there was in natural this, areas, they're supposed to be getting knocked out, right? If if there was not this other race on the planet, do you think they would have ever had that discussion, or would they have just given them the cure? That's a good question. That is a good question. Know. Because uh, either way, in either scenario, still messing with evolution. Right. Yeah. And if they had yeah. if they had invented warp drive, then they would be worthy of helping. Or but if they hadn't invent warp drive, they wouldn't be. The warp like, the warp drive thing was just a way for Archer to have an issue. I, I really think like it, well, it, it almost seems the warp drive. On. They ask well, that's, that's, that's an obvious a, easy no, but but that's that's Vulcan. I mean Vulcan that was their criteria too. But but that right. that in turns gives us that discussion between T'Pol and Archer. Ar Archer is really upset at this point after he spoke with Phlox. He's very upset about this. He's he's like, what what the hell do I do? And now I'm going to talk to my my first officer, which obviously is T'Pol. And T'Pol, you know, with her normal, you know, her normal average, you know, ready to react to everything because that's who she is. Uh, you know, she says, you know, we you know we, we were there for ninety years. You know, we've, we we we're still there. And you had already invented warp drive in your case, right? Where yeah. he's, they're like, he's like, she's like, even if we gave them the schematics, like yeah, they're going to blow their show, they're going to blow themselves up where they can't deal with any matter or something like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Um, I think that Kevin's question is, is you know, interesting because I think they, it, what, why would be the wrong decision to intervene here? I think is that, yeah, like, Maybe the mink would not have gotten a chance or whatever, but it's also about what, what is today and what is like sort of like these are people dying today. We see children dying in beds in this episode. You know, they don't yeah. deserve to live because of like natural selection. Go, you know, go screw well, yourself, right? Like, yeah, right. We have genetic defects in our own population. Do we just look at those people and go, well, oh, you know, evolution? Sorry. Yeah. Well, and that's Bye, thing, right? God. <laughs> and you know, obviously, we're in a discussion that there's no way we're gonna we're gonna get an answer to in the next fifteen to twenty minutes. But the the, oh, the I thing I really like, around. what's that? But, but this is the, the, I this have an answer. <laughs> well, well, we all have answer? an answer, I think, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's the right or wrong answer. Uh, but the I do love the discussion between Flox and Archer because Archer makes a really valid point. If if this is a disease, we would have we've already have already cured it. You're a doctor. This is your fucking job. Like your job is to help the sick and needy. That's what you're. He's like every time you is. do, every time you you treat somebody, you're intervening. You're interfering yeah, in you're natural. Intervening. You're you're playing God every time and you fight a virus for right. somebody or, or or something like that. So it and you know what? I out of all the times that I I hate Archer's dialogue in these episodes, Archer does some great dialogue in this episode. They really yeah. wrote well for him in this episode. It, it's. It, the 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 jumping back and forth between the two of them they both show equal respect which i really like there's no archer down talking to anybody in this episode which is something that he has done in the past well um, so i i have one maybe caveat to that because the whole okay. part where where he says to archer he's like respectively captain i think your compassion and your like for these people is clouding your vision here he goes my compassion guides my judgment don't you tell me my my compassion guides my judgment yeah it's you know very defensive a human kind of thing why wouldn't he be though he, uh, he's, he, he takes that very serious his compassion is the reason why he's out there right but, so but i think i can understand that this is one of those scenes where you know Archer is kind of growing. Your to your point earlier, Jody, you know, because <clears throat> he's starting to understand that he's not might not be the expert on everything out there. Yeah, and and he's listening to his first officer, who has considerable experience, as does her race, and and same with Doctor Flox. Yeah. And and that comes to a point where Archer was talking to one of the aliens as well, the alien that asked for the warp drive. He goes. Even if I give you warp drive and you decide you're going to zip out and you're going to meet aliens, how are you going to know that most of these aliens are going to even try to help you? Like most of them, he he goes, he goes, goes, I've you. been shot at. I've been trying, you know, I've had my freaking ship hijacked. Like, like, and I've only been it's out here like a month. Time to try to destroy me. <laughs> it's, a, it's only a month. It's only a month. <laughs> out. If your race it's been was like a month and like everybody's after my ass, you know, it's like, if your race was about to go to extinct, you would ask the same thing, right? Like yeah. if you were in oh, the absolutely. alien's you're, position. You're, you're begging. He, the, the alien is begging for, he's begging for a solution. 
And let's put it this way. If we were in the same situation, we would be doing the same. And you want to keep your race alive. You want to, you want to keep your people alive. And that makes perfect sense. Right. So, you know, we're, you know, there was, you know, at the beginning of this pandemic, if we bring, you know, COVID into play here, I'm sure a lot of us were thinking, fuck, I really hope we get a vaccine soon. Um, you know, and that's in this plays the same thing. You know, we want that. We, we want people to not suffer and we don't want people to die and stuff like that. And it's the same thing with this. This episode actually hits a little bit closer to home than I think it really should. It just happens to be this is an episode that we have to watch. Right. But mm -hmm. and, you know, I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things that really do line up to today even. Uh, when it comes to, you know, the arguments, you know, should I wear a face mask? Should I not wear a face mask? All that crap, you know, all the, all this, all this crap still comes down to this, these type of things. There's people that are strongly against that. There's people that are strongly for it. Um, you know, it's the same thing that happens with the, with this episode. We have, we have an alien race that's basically begging for uh, answers that they know that they can give them. Um, you know, the enterprise has the ability to deal with this, you know, Flox, I think one of the most powerful lines is when Flox says he's already had, you know, he already has the cure, you know, mm -hmm. he says this and Archer just looks at him with, you know, dumbfound look on his face. Like, what the hell? Why didn't you tell me this? You know, like that kind of thing. And it's like, you know, he's already figured out how to cure them. He, he already knows how to fix it. Uh, but the question is, should, should he? he? And, and that's where we get it. It's a very powerful episode. I think it's, I think it's extremely well written. I think this is probably the best written episode to date. Uh, and I would, I would argue that this is definitely the best episode of, of season one. And I like some of the episodes in season one a lot. So, you know, it's, it's also interesting. I just, sometimes I love these episodes that are this deep and touching so many issues to, 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 to go back to earth. And what's the Admiralty saying, you know, like yeah. what, are, what, you know, when they get the reports and like, Oh shit, you know, Archer should have done this or we support him or whatever. Like, I just love to know what, what's going on back home. Yeah. 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 That's a good point. Yeah. Because like, I think like, could you imagine like they get back to earth and then a sizable amount of people on earth are like, what the hell? You didn't help these Velocians. You didn't help these people? Yeah. <laughs> well, they could go back. I mean, at that point. Yeah. They're not dying. Well, you know, but like how many people, millions would die. Right. Yeah. So the end of the episode, really, we might as well just get to the end of it. Cause there's not much more at this point. Um, the, the end of the episode is essentially Flox gives them something that will alleviate and kind of prolong them for a decade. Gives them, them so. some Buckley's. Yeah, basically, he's he's like, here's some over-the-counter medication. This would be okay. Uh, you know, this is how you replicate it. And no, we're not going to help you any further than that. Right? That's that's really how the episode ends. Yeah, uh, they it's fly a fancier, away but... with the cure. Yeah, they have what the, the cure, hell? and they and, and they're gone. <laughs> and but but I don't know about you guys, but it, it's a very unsettling answer. Uh, but I can see why it has to be unsettling because there's no right answer here. Uh, yeah, there this is. is. This Give is. Give the people the thing that you to cure them. They do it in every other episode of Star yeah. Trek. But this is this is a different time, uh, and this is also a different crew. This is this is before sure. those all those things were in place. Yeah. Um, there's there's times where like you know, well, look at Janeway. Janeway killed a whole bunch of people, right? Um, you know, if you specific. if you compare different series, but different circumstance, obviously, but the same result. Um, and the question is, are, are they going to be, you know, what they've done here, is that going to help them enough that they will actually progress and figure out the cure themselves? <laughs> like his little um, speech here at the end where he's like, someday they're going to write a rule book for what you could do out here. But until oh, that then. Terrible. But until somebody tells me that they've drafted that direct directive, <laughs> I'm going to have to remind myself every day that we didn't come out here to play God. It's true, though. They're not out there to play God. They're out there to explore. So, yeah, I understand where Kevin's coming from. And he's saying, you know, they have the cure. They could have easily helped them. Okay, but before they we true, move. But we don't know what they what the outcome of that would be. If it weren't for the mank, they would have helped them. They would have. That's very possible. Yeah, very I think you're right about that. The natural evolution of this planet is for this species to die off and the mank to take over. Yep. Right. So that, that's what they're thinking. Play Archer, guys. Jody, what would you do? The same thing you already did. Kevin? I would give them the cure. Dave? I think um, if I'm Archer, I I don't I, I don't I do what he does in this episode. I I, I think I think he does but, but only because I know 
what comes after this and only because the writers of this episode know that the prime directive is a thing in the, in the yeah. centuries that come after this, but they don't know that yet. So I think like, I think like, yes, I think that I, I I'm armed with that knowledge. He's not, he's only he being told what, that. Yeah. yeah. So he's, he's going purely based on like flocks and to Paul's recommendations based on what their instincts are. Um, so what would you do, Adam? If you were, I, I, I'm with Kevin. I, I think I would give it to them. But I think that's the whole beauty but, of this episode. But hold on a second here. Whoever said at the beginning, um, kind of wish that that's what would have happened, and then make a big mistake. It was you, Dave. Uh, I, I, I do too. I, I wish that would have happened, and some, you know, just for them to learn more. And sometimes in Star Trek, it really drives me crazy how the writers treat us like we don't know. <laughs> what's what the bigger story is here and right. that's i was annoyed with that whole um yeah. dialogue as well you know um there was but an I episode next in next gen that where they they were talking about you know they were talking about uh the race that could only talk in metaphors oh yeah yeah the, dark yeah, yeah. Dar yeah. 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 yeah yeah and yeah, there is yeah. and they said like you know troy was Marines. talking about how you know talking about like, um describing romeo and juliet on a balcony you know, and everybody gets that. And then they go, which indicates love. Like, come on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like, treat us like we know something out there. But anyway. But 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 I think that the the fact that we're we're split on this kind of proves that this is a great episode because this is this is the Kobarashi Maru. This is this is that type of episode where you don't have there's no the clear, clear right answer here. No. Um and you know it certainly, you know, Kevin you know, you you said, yeah, I they had the cure. They should have just fucking gave it to them, which would make sense if if that was you, right? Uh, but not everybody thinks that way, and 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 that's the beauty of this episode is that we can interpret it which way if it was right or wrong based on our individual, uh, which I think is 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 the beauty of of ending it like this because yeah, we ended it in a way where I think it was right, but that doesn't really mean I'm right. Um, but which if is, you're right, which is then great. they should never, ever, 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 ever in Star Trek help us another species. I agree. That has a and disease. That, they should never help another species. Yep. Because it could, hurt that another, they it, it could hurt another species by, but yeah, you're right. Like by helping. And they've done that. They've done that. You know, if right? I help that, this that, people, it hurts examples this of that thing. in every yeah. series. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That they've helped one. They've helped one alien race, which has in turn screwed another one. Um, and that's and that's something that happens all the time in Star Trek. No, but those um, are the, these are the best episodes. They, you think about I the know, one with Data. He answered like that girl. You know, is anybody out there? And he goes, "Yes." Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, but but, you know. but here's the real question. The real question is, do I think Kevin's wrong? No. That's, that's good. That's what right. I. That's what I love about this episode <laughs> is the fact that you know Kevin. Kevin may think I'm wrong, uh, and that's possible. Uh, but. <laughs> Either way, it's still it's an opinion based answer for for this for this type of scenario. And we have to remember this is the first outing. And and that's one thing that a lot of people in Star Trek don't get when they watch the series is why are they doing it this way? Why are they doing it this way? Because they don't fucking know better. That's the There's reason no why. Rules. There's, There's no, no rules. <laughs> They're making it as they go. And this is this is Space Cowboys 101 right here. There's like no directive is, yet, Jody. There's yeah, no directive. There's no, no directive. directive, which we, directive. We get the, the, you know, you have such great writing in the entire episode, and then they end it with and that fucking answer. Yeah. <laughs> this is stupid, this but. is the part like the like the fact that they they say 90 years. They had 90 years to kind of contemplate. Like, when we get to the stars, we're gonna do this. But they yeah. it's like they like when we get to the stars, we're gonna make it up as we go. You know, yeah. I, I was thinking about that, and I think I may have been a little harsh when I said that because who knows what we're going to see, you know, and no, you know, we, we you, you have no idea. And the only thing they did have was some Vulcans that could have told them some stuff, but, um, but even that would have been very, um, you know, it would have directed them down a path if they had, you know, all that guidance from the, the Vulcans. And I think the Vulcans were right. Not, not sharing everything. I'm actually uh, I, I, through this, oh, through this series, I'm actually getting, um, getting the impression that the Vulcans, know a lot about technology, but actually don't know that much about what's going on in the universe. That's right, because they're they very They don't isolated. seem that curious about anything. I think they're, they're also isolated. They're themselves. Not yeah. even science, not even comets. But but if we look at if we look at the, we did the that I guess the ago, right? immaturity of their space travel, right? 
Um, I always think of when I think of these type of scenarios, I always think of the movie Alien, which I know uh, both me and uh, Adam are extremely huge fans of, and I'm sure you guys probably enjoy it as well. Yeah. Um, Alien, Alien brings up a very good premise. How do you deal with something you've never dealt with before? How can you be prepared for that? And it's it's these guys are not prepared because they've never dealt with it. Just because they have somebody who may have dealt with it on the ship, which is in this case, it could have been either the Denoblian or in this scenario, uh, the uh, the Vulcan. Uh, but they don't they they don't do that. The, this is this is the Enterprise crew, and this is an Earth ship. They have to do it their way. And their way isn't always right, which we, we see throughout this entire series. They fuck up all the time, which is great because that shows us how Picard ends up doing things correct, how Kirk did them better. And, 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 and really, when you hear everybody say about how Archer is the worst captain, well, he is the worst fucking captain because he doesn't know what the fuck he's doing and he doesn't have the previous experience. And that, that's right. the other thing I think in all of our jobs, you know, we have someone to go to for counseling and, yes. you know, you know, who's, who's usually higher up than the rest of us. Um, yeah. And out in space, they're making decisions. Yeah. Right or wrong. And they have to just go by what they want to, what they can do. And then that's why we get a prime directive. We get, we get a directive that tells us if you're in this scenario, this is what you should be doing. Yeah. And right. I, you, you totally yeah, get why breaks they, that all the time and <laughs> but we, they know? need it they absolutely need it they need oh, a, they need a playbook to work with yeah. but it goes to it, it goes to show you the immaturity of space travel like the, the, we don't know what the fuck we're doing right and when you look at the movie alien for instance you know a, an alien that they've never experienced before nothing like this before have they ever dealt with before they have to arm themselves and not know anything about their enemy and it, it kind of does it in the same way. And that's what I liked about the line that Archer said, where it's like, you know, even if I give you warp drive, what makes you think anybody's going to want to help you? Right. And he's so true because literally look at all the adventures we've had so far with Archer. Most of them haven't ended very well. <laughs> like, they've ended well enough. Killed but... every other week. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're getting so close to getting killed. But anyway, uh, but anyway, the episode ends like that. We also get uh, an ending to the, the arc of, of, um, of obviously flocks and his uh his love interest and you know they're just going to kind of be friends and and see where it goes see where, where it goes it i so actually like the way they button that up that was yeah that was i didn't want a whole lot of extra with him i i thought this was a great way to end that part um it's interesting because you know we still have room for him to continue with this yeah uh, but we don't need to make it a focus which is which is fantastic i i, I think overall you know what i i I don't have anything more to say about this episode. I think I've been very, uh, very open about it. I, I, I think it's a great episode. I, I get the impression that most of you guys are pretty, pretty mm -hmm. heavy on that as well. Mm -hmm. um, there won't be a sigh during ratings today. No <laughs> sigh on this one. Eh? Ooh, <laughs> a, a sigh free rating. This should be interesting. Uh, speaking of Work interesting, one, I think. You yeah, speaking of interesting, minutes? Adam. Yeah, Do you this, have anything a, interesting for us? I got lots actually. I'll try oh, to keep okay. it. Oh, okay. Let's hear it. Way over here, but we'll go. Yeah, that's all right. Let's... Okay. <clears throat> so, lots to say here. The the writer's first draft of the script of this episode was significantly different from how it, it uh, turned out. For example, none of the voiceovers were spoken by uh, Dr. Lu Lu Lucas with, uh, sorry, they were supposed to be by Dr. Lucas with Fox. Uh, and then they took it to Fox, taking them, all of them. So, I I like that whole I'm I'm writing somebody. It took a it took a bigger um, it it ex expanded in my opinion the the role of Fox here because it it gave him somebody to talk to rather than okay. just talking to himself. It's a lot like the episode with, when Data was writing that. Data's uh, day. Yes. Data's yeah. day. Yeah. Yeah. Data's so, day. Yeah. Yeah. He's he, the, he's writing that letter to Commander Maddox, and you know about everything. Yes. And, yeah. Right. Um, it's in that vein. Yeah. Okay. The episode originally ended with Flocks actually disobeying Archer's orders. Kevin mm -hmm. would have liked that. I would have liked that too. Um, John Billingsley offered in the original ending of this crisis of conscience, the doctor essentially does something that violates the standard issue of the obligations of a crew member to his captain and makes a decision that's rooted in, I've got bigger fish to fry rather than honoring his captain's wishes. Hmm. Uh, um, the first draft of the script um, in, in that, sorry, in that version, dis Flox, dis Flox discovers a cure for the, the, the plague, but keeps it a secret from Captain Archer. He firstly tells the captain he will do his best to find a cure, 
But then, in a subsequent scene with Archer and Paul, Phlox lies to them, telling the Vloxian's genetic stru structure is too fragile to be tampered with. Though Archer considers the Vul to go to the Vulcans uh, there after searching for a cure, but Paul comments the Vulcan's medical techniques are no more advanced than Phlox's. Um, and then, you know, Archer is urged to depart from the planet since it, there's nothing more they can do. Um, but, you know, at that point, Archer just gives, sorry, Archer just gives them, uh, 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 what do you call them, uh, a vaccine that will help them for three generations. Um, on the shuttle, park, uh, shuttle pod back to the Enterprise, Flox admits the truth to Dr. Lucas in a voiceover stating, I couldn't bring myself to alter the evolutionary process of this planet. I consider myself a man who values human compassion, but I find myself in this case, a slave to Vulcan logic. Have I made the right decision? I suspect to be asking myself that question for many years to come. Hmm. Um, and I'm more minor scene. So I, I just think it was a, a great, the one thing that when I read that, I don't think it did, good, it did a great job of saying how Phlox was tormented by his decision. Well, he does make make note of it, um, but he doesn't really expand on it at all. So, yeah, I, I think you're right on that. He, he, he says that he was like, I was, you know, at three in the morning before I came to get a piece of pie, Captain. Like, I was, were, you know, wondering if I was going to tell you, right? And just like his, you know, Archer's reaction. Uh, the, the, their choice to change this ending, I think, is a little too safe for me. I think that the original ending is probably better. Uh, yeah. Where Archer chooses to give this cure despite what Phlox is, is advising against. But uh, I don't think they wanted to do that to Archer, th to have him be even worse than he already is well so, i think they're yeah. i think they're trying to make archer have have a moral compass and i think that would definitely not be a good idea to do like we, we he needs to be a captain and part of being a captain is making those hard decisions where you have to follow that rule but um, I, I wonder too but the rule's not there yet right so Jody. who knows also, but you know, in the, just the ratings, like I mean, I'm sure by now people were just just driven crazy as by Archer as we are, and yeah. maybe and this late adjustment maybe was part of that as well. Yeah, I'm sure at this point, and and halfway through halfway through a first season of a, of a show, is where a lot of writers do do changes like that. So yeah, it's, he's a lot less petulant child, yeah, than he yeah. was at the beginning. Yeah, for sure. I think I, I think that might have been a very conscious decision on the writer's part to um, to try to not make him look more terrible uh, because he definitely doesn't come off as stellar in the first you know twelve episodes of the series. There's only been a handful of times where I've actually said, "Oh, you know, I actually like Archer's character. Uh, I like what he did here." Where most of the time it's you know, as Kevin says, he walks around and never looks at cameras. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's it's. I, I, I think you're right on that one. I, I think it probably was an active decision, but I guess we'll never know yeah. uh, until a writer tells us that. But. Um, looking back in the series in 2006, John Billingsley nominated this episode as one of his favorites and a turning point in the develop, um, development of Flocks, which we all said at the beginning. I agree. Yeah. Um, well, what was the t what, what, what turning point? an interesting way to say it, though, because like Flox had barely done or said anything uh, in these first 12 episodes. And, you know, and well, so. I mean, this is, let me go on. It, it was, let me quote him. It, it, was, it was the first episode I really had a lot to do. And we began to see there was more to this guy than, hey, fellow, well met, <laughs> which was a concern yeah. I'd had up to that point. That Flox was going to be essentially the cheery fellow who was also always willing to do an alien quirk and make us laugh. So I think he got what he this is the first time they used Billingsley to his acting potential, and like you know, and yeah. they did it great. I agree. Yeah, yeah. Well, and if we think of like even if we look at Gates McFadden, right? You know, the first the first season of uh, of Next Gen, and obviously she wasn't in the second season, but in the first season, she was really just a walk on character role. Like it, it's there was the occasional dialogue with her only when the story needed something to do with it medically. Uh, but for the most part, she was the same thing as Fox. Like she literally was there and, you know, if, if they were receiving somebody who was, who was sick or something like that, she would be there to explain something to us. And then that was it. Like we never really saw much of, of uh, Dr. Crusher for the first season. And then the third season, they started actually writing stuff for her. Cause it was uh, in her contract. When she came back, they begged her to come back. Yeah. Oh, yeah it was in her contract. Yeah. She had to have yeah. three Crusher, episodes a season 
there you go so but in a way that probably worked out well because i remember some of the crusher episodes being pretty interesting uh with the exception of sub rosa but uh, sub rosa is a great episode great sub episode. rosa is an abomination to star trek <laughs> but anyway whatever candles but nothing but trouble for your family <laughs> having said oh, no, that, that candle I, I'm with you, Jody. Like, I hated that episode. Actually. It's a terrible episode. <laughs> oh, it's so good. Get away from Nana! <laughs> did you okay. do that episode yeah, on Radio good. Theater yet? Oh, we did it a long time ago. Yeah, I thought you did. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely a good Radio Theater episode for sure. Well, yeah, I, yeah, it was. Uh, anyway. It was fun. All right, a few more uh, points here on, on continuity. The episode foreshadows more directly the concept of the Prime Directive, expanding on from brief mentions from Civilization and other episodes. Uh, Dr. Jeremy Lucas is later seen in, in the flesh in season four episodes, Cold Station 12 and The Augments. So, uh, yes. yeah, so I was right about that. You yep. were right about that, yeah. This episode contain, contains the second mention of the and first appearance of Movie Night. The movie being shown is the 1943 version of For the Home, Whom the Bell Tolls. Told you. Yep. Is that is and, that one you would cry on? Is that a movie that would no. uh, tears? I, I wouldn't, but I, I think it's always interesting when they again. I, I won't sell too much, but you know when they talk about watching movies that are classics, like considered real classics. Um, I really wouldn't watch that one myself. No, um, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't class that as a hard. Imagine classic, like they're watching it's a very well known movie or something like out there. Yeah, that would be amazing. Watching Fight Club. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, watching Fight Club, and they're like, "Hey, <laughs> this is classic." The episode follows a similar narrative structure to the next gen episode of Data's Day, in which the character provides narration in the form of correspondence to a colleague. It also bears re resemblance to Deep Space Nine in the pale moonlight. Yes. However, that episode features a personal log being recorded instead of a letter. Mm -hmm. Odo has yeah, one yeah. of those episodes too. Yeah, he does. I've been told I need to write a log. This is so <laughs> stupid. Odo. <laughs> what is this log? So all in all, I mean, there's there's more stuff here, but it really talks about how um, the episode was a groundbreaker and very Star Trek um, yes. focused and probably one of the best written, written ones out there. So this totally is one agree. of the only episodes that we watched so far that reminds me of the quality of like a season three to five episode of like Next Gen, right? Whereas like like the really good prime episodes. And, and uh, honestly, I mean, just look at the episode. conversations we've had tonight around this. I mean, it, we, could, oh, yeah. we could go on for hours on some of this. Oh, so. easily. Yeah, this is this is one of those things. Just the moral dilemmas alone in this, uh, you know, bring up a lot of stuff. So, uh, Sam saying we need a Gilligan's Island radio theater. Well, that might be doable. Oh, you, you never, you never know, Sam. Uh, yeah. You know, I you you are the biggest advocate for uh, for Gilligan's he says Island he's, podcast. Fun fact, Adam, about Gilligan's Island. Oh, please. Did you know that in the season two episode, Feed the Kitty, the lion charged at Bob Denver, who plays Gilligan, uh, when the, which if the lion hit him, it would have been a fatal blow. There you go. Thank God he wasn't killed. My yeah. goodness. Life wouldn't the be the same. National, Bob Denver. National Trevor. Yeah. Yeah. Sam, Sam's down to play the skipper. Okay. Well, hey. <laughs> you know what, Sam, we'll keep <laughs> you in mind. It's process, Sam. Come on. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll definitely keep you in mind. All right, all right. Thank you for the fun facts, Adam. So uh, let's uh, let's get to ratings because I'm really interested to see what's going on here. Because uh, Kevin, this is going to be an episode that I'm going to be shocked by Kevin's answer. I think. Why? So, okay. I don't know. I already I, said I, just, I like it. Jesus. I know you like it, but <laughs> how well? No you like? <laughs> how it's much? Unusual. Your average right now is five point eight, which in comparison to the other three of us, um, you know, My average is five point eight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's your average. After 12 it's, about episodes. it's about to go up. It's about it to go about up to go because, yeah, like me, Jody, and Adam are all you know around seven, seven point one, and uh, and not you. You're you're. A whole and if we can get Ke if we can get Kevin to go over, you know, six, six. we're happy. Yeah. Okay. Are we starting so, with uh, me. We'll start with Kevin, I guess. Let's start with Kevin. Nine. Nine. That's strong. That's strong. Hey, he's over six now. All right, good stuff. Yeah, I'm, I'm going <laughs> nine and a half for me. I'm with you, Dave. I, you know, I liked last week, but I really like this one even yeah. more. So nine point five. I'm doing nine point five as well. That's exactly Great episode. 
And I'm still the lowest. Still the lowest, but you know, bell curve, bell curve. Um, so, uh, that, but that's averaging at 9.4, which easily puts it at the best episode so far. Um, uh, with I agree. Only the Andorian incident sitting at 8.6 in comparison. Which is still a fantastic episode. And Broken Bow at 8.3 being the next highest after that. Um, yeah. yeah. So uh, this has an 8.1 in IMDb, which is higher than any, uh, only tied with the Andorian incident for, uh, for rating there. Um, and was written by Maria and Andre Jack Jackametin, uh, mm-hmm. directed by James Contner. Fantastic writing, yeah. I don't Great know if it was, oh, I guess and they also wrote this episode, Breaking the Ice, the same writing team, really. Yeah, really, wow. which we like, we liked it okay. Breaking the Ice, it was good enough, but it wasn't, it wasn't stellar like this one, but, yeah. This uh, one was better, but. You know, maybe we'll maybe we'll come to know their names as we go through you know, these episodes. For for me, you know, watching this again this week, to me, it's like okay, memorable Star Trek ep- um, episodes of doesn't matter what show. This is in my top twenty now. I think. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. I think it's. Yeah, I, I think it is one of the definitive Enterprise episodes. Yeah, in a lot of ways. All right. Yeah. So there's the ratings, uh, Jody. What do we got coming up next? Next week we have Sleeping Dogs, which I love the I love the name of this episode. Uh, but this is the episode where Paul, Hoshi, and Reed become stranded aboard a Klingon uh, vessel after they are ambushed by a, a female Klingon. Uh, wow. It's not actually... about Porthos sleeping. No, it's not about Porthos sleeping. So, okay. uh, but anyway, the Sleeping Dogs thing makes more sense when you watch the whole episode. But I won't give it away. Um, but uh, if you know the term anyway, you I don't remember that episode. I don't even know if I've seen it. So uh, uh, the the woman who plays the Klingon, uh, the woman Klingon, actually was on ER. Uh, she was on ER, the show ER for Juliana uh, Margulies. No, it wasn't Juliana Margulies. Uh, oh. I can't remember her name, but she she did about seven or eight episodes of ER. Uh, she was like a, a a reoccurring guest thing. And the only reason why I know that is because recently my wife rewatched ER. Uh, and then I'm like, hey, that looks familiar. And then when I looked her up, I'm like, oh, yeah, she was on Enterprise. Clooney so, was on that show. Yes, he was. Clooney was on that show. He he started it with uh, with a bunch of them there. With his, uh, uh, anyway, the Dave. Yes. You know what? Sleeping Dogs is interesting. This episode was fantastic. But you know what? It's not the only thing we have on this channel. No, it's not, Jody. Here on Monday nights, of course, Star Trek Enterprise rewatch as we continue. And now, hey, we're getting into some good content here. Um, uh, and also on D Space Nine at nine ish, every Tuesday night, Jeff Maynard leading the charge over there as we've been watching every episode in order. Uh, now into season five. Three and a half can... year, uh, year uh, run, is it? Three and it's half been years? like two years. It'll be two years this April since we started. But what was uh, it? Three and a half years for the whole run? Yeah, Jeff, guys, Jeff's like, yeah. I want to do a D Space Nine rewatch. I said, Jeff, it's going to take three and a half years. He's like, I don't care. And that's how it started. Well, you're so, already two years in, so you must be having fun with it. Yeah, so we, we got another, uh, we're into season five, which goes to season seven. Um, good good and this, season. We just talked yeah. about uh, the assignment last week. That was the one where Keiko got taken over by Pa Race. Oh, and yeah. then uh, tomorrow's episode, um, I actually don't remember. Jo- uh, Trials and Tribulations. Tribulations. Trials and Tribulations yep. tomorrow. Yep. So we're going back to the original series. Uh, great, for t- great episode. Yeah, so really excited to talk about that. Just remember, um, we don't talk about the Klingons. Yeah, we do not talk about it with outsiders. We don't talk about it with outsiders. They are yeah. Klingons. So, uh, and then Thursday nights, we're often talking about the newest episode of Star Trek, uh, whatever that happens to be. Right now, it's Star Trek Discovery, season four, the second half right now. Uh, Michael Chan, who's from uh, the, you know this very channel often, he's recently been on an episode. Uh, I think we did mention that in the last podcast. He was in episode eight of season four, right at the beginning, called All In. Um, he's, had, he's had a baby recently. He's been in Star Trek. Like, this guy's just rolling, eh? Yeah, you know. You it's, buy some lottery the, tickets or something. You're the tiger. It's a lot yeah, going for year. Michael Chan. Um, yeah, so, uh, yes, yeah, so we talked about that with Michael Chan and, um, and and uh, Adam Woodward, and maybe Ashley Millard if she's not working uh, on Thursday. Um, and I uh, think she will such, be. Such a great okay. episode, though. That's a fantastic episode. Yeah, I'm excited. I always excited to talk with Discovery with that crew, and uh, and also we. You oh, know, I we meant have DS9, to... but anyway. Oh, DS9. Yeah. And then start... <laughs> I'm still thinking of DS9. <laughs> you still see with that Trials and Tribulations episode, and then um, uh, but uh, but so, but Adam and I and uh, the crew, uh, Michael and, and Ashley, will be on. We talked about Star Trek Prodigy before that. It was doing that with Davin Skelhorn and uh, Jessica Chan, Star Trek Lower Decks, and all the new shows that have been coming out. Star Trek Picard on the horizon, everybody. I can't um, wait. Yeah, coming up. I'm the March. only one in the world excited for that, but I'm excited. 
Totally okay, well, two of us are. You're not, we got, hey, okay. that's, that's enough. Um, you know, and so uh, to correspond with the premiere of Star Trek um, uh, Picard's second season, we're going to be doing our next radio theater. We just did one this, uh, this past uh, Saturday. We did Looking for Parmok in All the Wrong Places, which is a Deep Space Nine episode. Uh, we mm-hmm. did that on Saturday night. So the edited version to come out in the next two weeks, uh, there was a couple uh babies and things going on uh so we might have to do we had some we have some adr to do but uh to correspond with the premiere of uh season two of star trek card we're doing our uh episode two of radio theater is going to feature jody simpson as q from the episode hide in q I'll be Captain Picard and uh, we got Steve Shives coming back to play Commander Riker. Uh, Steve's fantastic. No beard Riker. No beard uh, Riker sexy Riker. Right. Uh, to your point earlier about uh, Dr. Crusher not getting much to do in the first season, my wife will be playing Dr. Crusher and she will not have that much to do. So, <laughs> <laughs> and I well, have literally, she's in like the first, first part of the episode, isn't she? And then she she's gets barely... to stand beside Wesley later on. She's that's mostly, about yeah, that's about it. Yeah. And like, yeah. And speaking of Wesley, Kevin Millard playing uh, uh, Wesley Crusher, uh, young and old versions. Uh, I can't uh, wait to see that. Yeah, yeah. so it's going to be good. This will be on um, March 5th, um, the Saturday night. Uh, we'll be doing this, and I'm uh, really looking forward to uh That's two Steve weeks from now. And uh, back two, for that. Almost two weeks, yeah. And this episode is going to be really good, because it's just, it's like, a, it's it's the 10th episode of the it's, first season. It's so, it's a terrible episode, though, which is makes it even better. The it's going to be a great radio theater, so though. stupid, uh, but it's going yeah. to be great. Yeah. It's so original series-esque uh, yeah, in so many fantastic. ways. Yeah, so that's coming up. Uh, that's uh, that's uh, those are the big plugs here on Live Long and Podcast. Uh, Strange New Worlds coming down the road in May, and then I guess we got a new movie, probably not this year, probably next year with the Chris Pine crew that's you know coming out and Lower Decks. Hopefully, it won't be a snore fest like Beyond was. Yeah, hopefully not. Hopefully, it's better than Beyond was a snore fest. fest. Adam, get over it. Oh my God, you guys are so harsh. It's so boring. Hey, we all like I have the seen first that movie. movie three times. I still have no idea what happened. I, I, like, I like Beyond. I like Beyond Adam. I'm not a Beyond hater. I I don't like Into Darkness. I think that's the bad movie of the three. Um. Anyway, we we don't have time for me to debate. We don't have this, time to but... get into all that. <laughs> but yeah. Anyway, and then I of course I agree. Got... Out of the Calvin timeline, the first one is still the best one. Oh, that, when is the for three sure. hour yes. tour starting? One day, Sam. One, Sam, one day. <laughs> one day. Come on, Sam. <laughs> Sam, it's gonna happen. We just don't know when. We just don't know when. But we got you too know, much keep content going, going on right now. Yeah. So. Uh, one day. One day. It's, Enterprise uh, won't be done for about another year and a half, two years. I promise uh, you, it will happen one day. I just don't know. So. If it won't be this day. Um, <laughs> DS9, probably when DS9 uh, finishes, which I think will be around the same time as that. Yeah, I think I need to get like one of those off my plate at least. So yeah, uh, yeah. it's first. a lot of work. Uh, Sam, yeah. Sam, it's a lot of work. Uh, poor, poor Dave. Like, yeah, it's not, watching the show is easy. Hard. Talking about the show is easy. Not a little bit more work, but but it's 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 just like it's getting the show ready and then the commitment of it. So anyway, Super Mater Brothers Podcasting, a channel Jeff and Mater and I started. Uh, we also do a lot of podcasts with Jamil Robinson over there, but all kinds of different uh, content, including Big Brother, Survivor um, as well. I saw that uh, Sam, was, Island. Sam was asking if I'm, if I'm excited for the eviction tonight, of course. And then we're covering the finale of Celebrity Big Brother 3 on Wednesday uh, with Jeff Mater. We haven't been doing every episode this for this Celebrity Big Brother. It's just been too much. <laughs> I call that one not so celebrity big brother well it's got because like literally the most popular person on there is uh, is todd bridges from like different strokes he's not the most famous oh come on oh come on like it's got Who's um... more famous than him on there what are you talking well, about like Willis? lamar odom who, who? He was on, <laughs> the one married to chloe kardashian oh yeah like that matters uh, and he so... was on the what? Who? He was on like, the LA Lakers for like the Kobe that's, Shaq. That's like franchise. becoming a celebrity because you had a sex tape. He oh, won wait. two champ. He won two NBA championships with Kobe and Shaq. Oh, good for him. Yeah. I don't know. Who? <laughs> I know who Kobe and Shaq are. Well, they're not going to put Tom Cruise in the house. Like what? I don't if they if they what? could get what him, is they it, would. Why isn't but... Shaq on there? Nobody yeah. wants. I know Tom Kobe Cruise isn't, but I hope actually, isn't Shaq on it there. was interesting because the other night, Jerry O'Connell. From Star Trek Lower Decks, who does the com- I know Commander Ransom Connell voice? Is. He He's was more of a celebrity. He just than showed up all of a sudden. He showed Parada, up all of a sudden. Three D. Yeah, and he was like Ju- Julie Chen. I need to be on this show. You need to be. I'm a D list celebrity. I was like, come on, Jerry O'Connor. You are better than that. You were in. You're like a C list. 
You're at least a C-list. Todd Bridges is D-list. Todd Bridges, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, who's Willis? No more than us, though. Anyway, we got all kinds of stuff over there. Uh, Super Mario Brothers podcast, you check that out. And then Trivial Debates, our third channel, uh, where we argue about movies, TV, sports, and like a game show format. Our next episode coming up this Sunday, Jeff Mater hosting. Where is it? Um, oh, I'm on this one, aren't I? You're on this one, Jody. You're going oh, yes. to battle. I have to which... get my answers. We're good. Yeah. All you got to do is excite Max enough to knock over a whole table full of beers right <laughs> onto some kids, and you'll have I the saw... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Couldn't be hard. I... I saw him the other weekend and he did that. He saw us, he jumped up to give Ashley a hug and knocked beer all over some kids. <laughs> I, already, I already know who he picked for his sports question because I tried to pick it and I couldn't because he already got his answer in. And uh, it's very surprising considering he happens to be, well, I won't go too far into it, but he happens to be in that fan base that he's yeah. going to complain about. Some so interesting questions be coming out of Jeff for this one. So I'm excited yeah, to see this bad. one yeah, to come uh, together. Um, okay. Misha, Misha Tate. Is she not famous? Who the hell Who? is Misha? You have UFC fighter. Okay. No idea. Okay. Don't care. Uh, yeah. Todd, do you guys know Todrick Hall? No. He's problematic. Okay. Anyway. Right. <laughs> All right. All I'm saying right. is if you're going to make a celebrity big brother, it might be a good idea to have celebrities that people actually know who they are. Chris Kattan. I know who Chris Kattan is. He ate some cake and then he left. Mm -hmm. Yeah, he I'm, did that. I'm willing to just believe that it's just me. I'm just out of touch. Oh, is that what it is? And I'm happy there. Yeah. yeah, me too, Kevin. Uh, anyway, are you, done, are you done plugging? <laughs> what is love? <laughs> Don't hurt me. Yeah, Lady, don't, get, hurt don't, me. Don't, don't get don't hurt me. No more. Anyway. All right. You got your plugs? Come on, Jody. Keep us on track. I'm trying to. But unfortunately, I have a Sandman who goes a little nutty. Okay. All right. Anyway, you all done? Right. I'm done. You plugged everything? Plugged it. All right. Fair enough. Uh, speaking of plugs, uh, the Cooters of Tra of uh, Trek. The Cooters or of Trek and X Men: The Animated se X Series rewatch X Rated from Davin Scalehorn, my cousin and yours. Uh, he yes. tomorrow night he's interviewing the creators of X Men: The Animated Series. He is, uh, is on his podcast. Yeah. yeah so yeah. congratulations to and him. And also, uh, we're unfortunately not going to have Adam next week because uh, Adam um, will be traveling. I, I uh, yeah, I just will be. It'd be too early to join. Well, unfortunately, fair enough. There, fair yeah. enough. And so we decided we were going to have Davin come in to, to take your place. Uh, oh, he's, for, he's a great for, guy yeah. for tomorrow good, night or good hands. next week. Yeah. So, so look forward to that. We'll have, we'll have him as a special guest host uh, next week. Mm -hmm. uh, so all the Adam fans will unfortunately not uh, need to attend next week. Unfortunately. Adam, where are you going? I'm going to be <laughs> British Columbia there, Sam. He's oh. leaving on a jet plane and he don't know when he'll be back. Well, if, you're, if you're going to Newfoundland, Make sure to hit up Sam. I will. Yes. <laughs> Sam, Sam is in Newfoundland. So Yeah, he says, uh, Come to Newfoundland. The fans are calling for you. <laughs> See? <Not> the fan. <laughs> you know what? Sam, if I get there, I'll definitely look you up. <laughs> we now, should go I, to I, Newfoundland and do a live podcast. It'll just be <laughs> Sam in a room and us up on stage. Well, man, That's what, fine. We can do the rock. <laughs> That's fine. I say we do it. Yeah, all right. He, right. Sam can you, bring his friends. If you tell me there's we, beer, we'll be yeah. we'll be there. Sam, bring all your friends, and we'll even. I promise we'll do a, a Gilligan's Island uh, rewatch <laughs> for just that night, one night only. Oh my there god, you go. uh, we'll have to get that arranged. <laughs> I don't know who's paying for my plane ticket, but somebody is. Oh, you can all, we can all stay at his house. We don't even need budget. <laughs> no factor. Okay. Sorry, Sam, but this is getting a little weird. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Anyway, right. I'm just kidding. Take I'm us, kidding. take us away, Jody. How do we? That's, uh, that, that's that. That's that Newfoundland uh, hospitality. 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 Yeah, East that's Coast hospitality. Uh, always, they're always good for the hospitality there. Uh, anyway, that's it, guys. Uh, so I think uh, overall, I think this was a great episode. I, I think everybody else has made it very clear that they enjoyed it as well. Uh, so hopefully, we'll still have some more coming coming forward. Uh, something that Kevin cannot bitch about in another podcast that he doesn't Please. think I'm listening to. <laughs> if, if Kevin doesn't sigh before he rates, it's a good thing. It, it, you know what? We should actually have a separate column for did Kevin sigh? Yes or no? <laughs> yeah. And then we can tally how many times he sighed or not. Sigh. We can well, that 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 that? Too. I, I do that on every podcast. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I, well, when I watch the DS9 ones, I noticed that you do that quite heavily on that as well. So. I'm just when it's bad, I'm so disappointed. 
There you go. But you know what? Sometimes it takes a lot to impress uh, Kevin. And I think we clearly impressed him with this episode. So we're good. Yeah. Uh, anyway, for all of us, uh, you know, have a great night and uh, hope to see you again. So, Dave, play us something out. It's mating season, so you know how that goes. I thought human reproduction was complicated. Your denobulans make us look like single cell organisms. <laughs>